Hi everyone, I want to walk you through how we deal with the data we collected for AC3 Proust's Law. Now on Friday, we talked about the type of reaction that we collected data from in this experiment, and it was a synthesis reaction. And fundamentally, the key idea to recognize in this particular experiment is that we have a product that has one atom of copper for every one atom of porphyrium. And that's important to know because not every reaction is going to form a compound that has atoms bonded to one another in a one-to-one -one ratio. You'll see where that comes into play later on as we walk through the data collection and analysis. So Friday we walked through all of this information and we ended with this nanoscale picture. And the reason why I wanted you to see this nanoscale picture is because it very much correlates with the data that we collected. So I'm going to give you some sample data. This is just going to be data that you won't have in your notebook, but it's going to be similar to how you're going to treat your own data. And that's important because that's what I'm going to ask you to try after you've watched the screencast. So the first piece of data that we collected in the lab was just the mass of the clean copper sample. And that's going to be labeled right here. That would be the first column in your data set. And for our example problem, let's say that it had a mass of 2.015 grams. That would be the mass of just the copper before any porphyrium reacted with it. Now the second piece of data that we collected was after we had reacted porphyrium with the surface of our copper mesh material. And the mass should have gone up because now we've got porphyrium attached to the surface atoms of carbon making a product, that copper porphyride. Let's say in this case that that mass was 2.5 6136 grams. Okay, the mass goes up because now we've got two elements where we once had one, and the mass should always increase in that case. Then, final step, we washed off all of our product, leaving behind only unreacted copper. That's going to be this third column in our data table that we collected uh, earlier last week. And let's say in that case that the mass happened to be 2.5958 grams. Now the whole point of this experiment was to see if we can learn something more about porphyrium. Porphyrium was that purple vapor that we reacted with the surface of the copper material. So in order to understand this, we can take advantage of something that we know based upon the equation that's given. We know that the, the elements combine in a one-to-one -one ratio to make that particular compound right? One atom of copper for every one atom of porphyrium. That's identified to us by just looking at the chemical formula of the product. That means those coefficients that you might see in the equation, those subscripts of the reactants, those aren't telling us what combination the atoms combine in. It's the chemical formula of the product that gives us that information. So let's see if we can figure out some basic information. And this would be information that you need for the analysis section. And we're going to start with this. Let's first start by thinking about how we can find just the mass of copper that reacted. Now the mass of copper that reacted fundamentally is really just this first layer of atoms. That's the first layer of atoms. Now if we think about it, we've got three sets of data labeled one, two, and three. And let's think about for a second how we would manipulate that data just to find the mass of copper. Now to do that, we'd fundamentally just take our measurement from that first column and subtract it from our measurement from the third column because the difference there is only the difference of copper atoms. So in this case, if I do that subtraction, what I get is a mass of 0 0.0057 grams, and that's of pure copper. So that's our first piece of data. Now the second piece we need to think about is, well, what mass of porphyrium atoms reacted? Now in that case, if we look at the data, we're only going to be concerned with figuring out the mass of these atoms that I've shown here in blue. In that case, what we're going to do is subtract the second column of data from our first. And in that case, we get a mass of 
0.0121 grams of porphyrium. Now here's the big idea. Okay, the big idea here is just by looking at, sorry, I'm gonna try and draw a light bulb here. The big idea here is that according to this reaction, equal numbers of copper and porphyrium atoms react together. So a mass number or a mass ratio So a mass ratio will tell us exactly which element is more massive because they have a one-to-one -one ratio. So there's a one-to-one -one ratio of copper to porphyrium. And we can see from the data that they do not have equivalent masses, which means one of the elements is gonna be more massive than the other. We can figure out exactly how much more massive one is than the other just by taking that simple ratio. Let's do porphyrium compared to copper. So if we take that number value that we calculated, 0.121 grams, and the amount of copper, 0 0.0057 grams, we get 2.12 over 1. What that means is, or we could say therefore, porphyrium is 2.12 times more massive than copper. That's interesting because that actually helps us to identify the true identity of this element that we've been calling porphyrium the entire time. So the way we can kind of take this information now is to just set up a mathematical expression using this value right here. Because we can tell information about copper just by looking at the periodic table. So you're going to need to make sure you have a periodic table handy for this next piece. So what we need to understand is if we wanted to find the mass of a porphyrium atom, we take that ratio, 2.12, and then all we need is the mass of a copper atom. Now, the masses that are given on the periodic table are going to be just below the symbol called the average atomic mass, the average atomic mass. And for the case of copper, it should be 63.546, and that unit is atomic mass units. So if we multiply that by the ratio value that we found, we're going to find that porphyrium is about... 134.7 atomic mass units. Now take a minute and see if you can predict what element that actually would be then, based upon that information. So we can use this technique for any element that we don't know its true identity. The only thing we're going to have to know is we're going to have to know the ratio that those atoms combine to form a compound. And this is really information that's derived from a concept called the law of definite proportions, meaning if we're doing a reaction that always results in one compound, that comp compound will have elements reacting together in a fixed ratio. Fundamentally, if you think about water, water has the formula H2O. That means hydrogen atoms always react with oxygen atoms in a two to one ratio if you're making water. If it's a different ratio, well, then you're just not making water. So let me summarize this in an equation that you're going to be able to use for in a broader application for other types of practice problems. So if we kind of take this in summary. The key idea here, and let's just kind of color code this. You're going to need to know some experimental data. And in, in fact, what you really need to know is an experimental mass ratio. And that's really what I used up above in this worked example. So you need to know an experimental mass ratio. And that mass ratio is always going to be equal to the product of the particle ratio in the compound. And remember, that's going to be determined by the chemical formula. And then when I said product, so multiplied by atomic masses, the ratio of atomic masses from the periodic table. So if we think about this in context of the problem that we just did, well, the experimental mass ratio in our case was the ratio of the mass of porphyrium 
that reacted over the mass of the copper that reacted. And then we can set that equal to the particle ratio, which in our case, based upon the chemical formula, for every one porphyrium atom, there is one copper atom. So that's where we get that information in blue from the chemical formula in the equation. And then we multiply that by a ratio of atomic masses from the periodic table. And that's kind of where, in our problem, we set that as our x value because we didn't know what the atomic mass units were for porphyrium. But for copper, we do know that. We can look at copper's information on the periodic table and find that it was 63.546. Okay, so just generically, I guess we should say, we could set it up like this. Average atomic mass of porphyrium from the periodic table over the average atomic mass of copper from the periodic table. Okay. And if we think about it just in the context of the problem that you just saw me simplify, okay, so to go back up here, this in black doesn't necessarily look exactly the same as what you've seen me set up here in red and in blue and in green, but it actually is the same. Let me, let me show you how. The mass of the porphyrium that reacted in our problem using our sample data 0.0121 grams. The mass of copper that reacted was 0.0057 grams. Our particle ratio was one to one. So really that doesn't change anything about our multiplication. And then finally, our average atomic masses. Now our average atomic masses for porphyrium, we don't know what that value was, so we could just leave it as X. So X AMUs over the at average atomic mass of copper, which the periodic table, 63.546 atomic mass units. And all we're gonna do is use our algebraic skills, solve for X, and you'll see that we're doing mathematically the same thing in the solution up here in black as what we would do using this more generic summation. So what I want you to try now is apply this strategy with your data that you collected on Thursday and on Friday of last week. Once you've finished that, make sure that your analyzing questions are completed and check Schoology for the remaining requirements for today. Hope you guys have a great day. Write down questions as you work because this is a strategy that takes some practice. And we'll talk about any questions that you come up with at the beginning of class tomorrow. Have a good one, guys.